That one too. All right, recording. What? All right, minimizing cold side oxidation by Stephen Newts. Let's do this. So, what is oxidation? It's typically known as beer's worst enemy or enemy number one. Anybody that's brewed for more than a year probably knows this and hopefully sooner because I think that the literature is coming out saying how important um, it is to eliminate oxidation as much as possible in the cold side. Um, it's so important that breweries spend enormous amounts of time, effort, and money reducing dissolved oxygen levels at any point during the um, brewing process, you know, after adding it in the beginning of fermentation, of course, because that helps with the yeast. But um, the reason is, is I feel like it's much more common and much more easy to ruin a gigantic batch of beer due to oxygen ingress than it is to say like infection. Because if you just have one faulty seal, maybe like one open ball valve on the top of a fermenter or whatever that you didn't notice, just that is enough to ruin, you know, your entire batch and all that, all that money and all that effort has just been uh, poured down the drain. So basically what happens, why, uh, like the mechanism behind oxidation is that um, free dioxygen molecules, dioxygen being two oxygen atoms bonded together, which is um, easily the most common form of oxygen in our atmosphere. They have unpaired electrons on the exterior of their structure. And those unpaired electrons really want to pair with other things. And they really want to share their electrons with other molecules. So what they'll do if they enter your beer is bind to amino acids, lipids, which is another name for fat, and melanoidins. Um, and those are both from the malts and the hops. And since they now change the chemical structure, change the shape of that molecule, uh, you're effectively changing the way your mouth perceives the flavor and how they affect light and appearance, head retention, stuff like that. Um, and just participate to the staling of the beer. Oxidation is similar to how fruits and vegetables go brown after you cut them. So if you notice if you um, cut a pear or an apple and leave it at room temperature, it'll start to turn brown before your eyes almost. A large part of that is due to oxygen. It's actually why a lot of your cells in your body age is because oxygen is just naturally damaging to living and uh, living organisms. It's why things rust as well. Um, rust is iron oxide. So it's when oxygen gets onto rust and bonds itself to it with the help of water. Um, the target level of acceptable dissolved oxygen is only half of part per million or 500 parts per billion. So totally minuscule amounts um, is enough to ruin a batch. And 500 parts per billion is the standard. It's really hard to get below this level. And anything above it, you could perceive a negative impact with the quality of your beer. What oxidation looks like in beer um, is a browning of the appearance. Um, as you can tell on this picture, on the left, looks like a hazy IPA. Um, and on the right is maybe the same beer, but subjected to oxygen. Um, super obvious and disgusting color change. Um, if you've ever left a um, glass of beer out overnight and came back to it in the morning, it looks like it's, you know, 10 SRM darker. Like it's like you'll take a pale beer, leave it overnight, and in the morning it'll be brown. That's due to oxygen. What it does is your the taste of the beer is generally give it like a dull flavor. Um, you'll notice that you'll not have much hop aroma or hop flavor, and your malts will almost blend together into the soup of just meh. Um, the malt flavors actually show up a lot as maybe like a sherry or wet cardboard flavor is the most common descriptor. And then I believe um, when people, you may have heard this term, but like a homebrew flavor or homebrew taste, I think that is mostly due to oxidation. You might wonder if, you, especially if you're new to brewing, why your beers don't taste as good as a commercial example. Um, you might, 
I would consider oxidation as the first culprit. Um, you'll just won't think that your hops are bright. You won't be able to distinguish malts. Um, and obviously it'll look darker. Oxygen also helps produce acetic acid in sour beers. Um, Britannomyces is a yeast that produces acetic acid in the presence of oxygen. And uh, same with acetobacter, which you never want in your beer. Um, if you are brewing a sour beer and it happens to have a little bit of acetobacter, maybe a fruit fly landed in your beer, um, if there's oxygen as well as an acetobacter, uh, you could risk turning your beer into a vinegary flavor. Um, hops contain a lot of the acids that bond with oxygen and create this oxidation uh, off flavor. So beers like New England IPAs with a shit ton of hops, they're going to be way more susceptible to oxidation than uh, most other styles. And styles of beer that actually taste not too bad with a little bit of oxygen or stuff like Imperial Stouts or Whiskey Age or Whiskey Barrel Age Stouts. I feel like a little bit of oxidation um, in those beers is not nearly as bad. Um, I feel like the it's just harder to detect because the flavors that oxidation can give almost disguise themselves as a darker, maybe a caramel malt um, in low amounts. And I really do stress in low amounts, but I feel like if you were to oxidize any beer a little bit, dark beers are probably gonna be more forgiving for you, uh, which is why I think if you're starting out brewing or maybe you don't have equipment that's good at eliminating oxygen from your system, uh, especially me personally, when I first started, I didn't know oxygen was a bad thing after fermentation. And I noticed that my darker beers always tasted higher quality than my pale beers. And I, I would suspect this is due to the oxidation effect. The common causes of oxidation, I think the biggest one is transferring from your uh, primary fermenter to a secondary fermenter after your fermentation is complete. Also opening the lid to your fermenter after fermentation complete is just a complete no-no unless maybe you're dry hopping and you have to get those hops in there somehow, obviously. The reason why I stress um, after fermentation is complete is because there will no longer be a positive pressure environment generated by the CO2 production. So if you were to transfer to a different vessel, you won't have the CO2 generated by fermentation to push um, out incoming atmospheric air. So I would suggest if you do use a secondary fermenter, don't do it after primary, primary fermentation is complete unless you do plan on doing an actual secondary fermentation with um, a different strain of yeast or bacteria. And I'll get onto that later. I'll, I'll mention more about that later. Um, I already mentioned barrel aging a little bit. Um, since wood is porous, it does let a slight trickle of oxygen enter your beer that's in a barrel. Um, obviously, if this were a huge issue, wouldn't, we wouldn't be using barrels, um, but it does happen. Um, I guess if you were to keep a barrel full of beer for longer than a year or two, you'll get some negative effects. Um, obviously, a faulty seal in your fermenter, let's say your lid doesn't close all the way. I don't even have to explain that one. Or maybe like your airlock runs dry. I think that's a common one. Like I've, a lot of brewers will go on vacation and then the liquid in their airlock will evaporate and you no longer have a barrier between the atmosphere and your beer your whole batch is probably ruined at that point. Um, another one that I don't see a lot of people talking about, but what I've noticed is if you're using tubing to transfer from fermenter to a different fermenter or into a keg, if you don't have a complete seal between the barb fitting and your tube, and there's a little bit of air gap between those two, let's say you didn't clamp down a hose clamp tight enough, what will happen is actually a Venturi effect will happen where the liquid entering, your, the liquid exiting your vessel will draw in air like a straw from the atmosphere and you'll see bubbles running down the length of your tubing. And that's pretty much injecting atmospheric air directly into the stream. 
like right into the vein, so to speak. And it's not going to the headspace, it's going right into your beer. So you could, if you don't have a like complete seal around your tubing, like make sure there's just zero bubbles. Just look for bubbles. Don't transfer. If you see bubbles in your tubing and it's coming from the air, just stop and redo it. Um, also storing beer in plastic for long periods of time. Sorry, I gotta like drink some water. <laughs> um, can result in a little bit of oxidation because plastic is permeable on like glass. So for long-term storage, I would recommend uh, transferring to a glass carboy before fermentation is complete, like I mentioned in the first bullet, because plastic does let in a little bit of oxygen. Um, and it really is for long periods of time. I'm thinking over six months. I don't think people often store plastic or store beer in plastic for that long, but, oops, sorry. It's had to been done. Another final top, final common cause of oxidation is cold crashing. And I'll get more to this later. More in secondary fermenter. Um, again, don't do it after the beer is done fermenting. Like I said, no oxygen, sorry, no CO2 driving out the incoming air. And um, I would say that it is safe to go to secondary after fermentation if you are adding some fruit or other microbes to do a second ferment. And what will happen is that the yeast on the fruit or stuff that you add will consume any of the oxygen that's uh, made its way in. So when you cold crash a beer, uh, the volume of your beer will decrease because its temperature decreases. It's one of the laws of thermodynamics. So what you should do is make sure that your fermenter sucks in carbon dioxide or nothing at all when you're, in a, when you're doing a cold crash. I know from experience, um, you can suck more than a liter of volume from the atmosphere into your beer if you don't have any barrier. Um, there's some cool technology, sorry. <clears throat> there's some cool technology to help you out with this. This one where my cursor is, I forget what they call it. It's like a CO2 capture device. And what happens is that this blow off tube coming from the top right corner is from your fermenter. There'll be star sand in here and the CO2 from fermentation will push out all that star sand into the second vessel and then escape out this airlock. And what happens is that over time, this jar right here will fill up completely with CO2. And then when you go to car cold crash, it'll pull CO2 in instead of atmospheric air or star sand or anything. Um, another common technique is people using balloons or a form of balloon filled with CO2 and hooking it up to their carboy before uh, fermentation, sorry, cold crash. Um, this looks like one of those like catheter bags. I'm pretty sure it's what it is uh, filled with CO2. A lot of people use like a Mylar balloon. Uh, if you attach it to your fermenter before cold crashing, it'll suck that CO2 in, not atmospheric air. Uh, this is the thing I have that I've installed in my stainless fermenters. Um, it's a tri-clamp fitting with a gas ball lock on it. And so what you can do is hook up a CO2 regulator to that. And so that way you're just sucking out of your CO2 tank when you're cold crashing. Another common cause for oxidation is when you're bottling. Um, make sure you purge your bottles with CO2 just to try to get rid of any of the oxygen that's currently in your bottle and that could mix with the beverage when you're filling it up. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, as well as adding fresh yeast uh, to your bottles will help consume some of the oxygen that it's in there so it can generate uh, more cells. And um, you wanna make sure you only add like a little bit of this yeast. So it's um, incentivized to reproduce in the presence of oxygen and consume it. When you're bottling, I would try to go as quick as you can to try to like minimize the amount of contact time between your beer and the atmosphere. So um, plan everything ahead. Uh, make sure everything is in place so that by the time you open up your bottling bucket or your carboy, uh, you're ready to rock. Um, also, what I do is I don't actually use a bottling bucket. 
if I bottle condition beers, what I do is I add sugar and yeast actually to uh, all the bottles individually. In that way, uh, I don't have to transfer from my fermenter to a bottling bucket, which has a gigantic surface area on the top. Um, so I totally skip that step. I risk, uh, I don't risk like sucking in oxygen through any more tubing that I don't have to. Um, it just works out better for me. Um, also, when you're bottling, make sure you uh, cap on foam because uh, when you generate foam in your bottle, uh, that foam will actually, actually act as a uh, physical barrier against the atmosphere. So when you cap on it, there shouldn't be like oxygen making its way through the foam. Typical technique. Um, what I really like to do and what I think is actually the biggest help is doing closed transfer methods between vessels. This is just when you have a closed loop, you have no um, you have no opening to the atmosphere when you're kegging or transferring. So this is kind of my setup right here. I have a CO2 tank hooked up to my ball uh, disconnect. Um, and then I attach the um, output of my fermenter to the beverage out of my keg. That way um, I just put some like two PSI uh, on the top. So as the volume in my fermenter is draining, it's getting replaced by CO2. And then as the beer is entering the keg, um, I do have the pressure release valve open. So the air in the keg is getting pushed out at the same time. Um, I think this is the best way to do it. I know a lot of people probably have good success not doing all this, but I, I like the insurance of it. Um, and as always, make sure to purge your kegs with CO2 before and after kegging. Uh, if you're really wanting to get 100% of all the oxygen out of the keg, what you should do is fill it completely full of a star sand solution uh, and then displace all of that with CO2. So if you start with a full keg full of star sand and either hit it with your CO2 tank to run it all out or use the CO2 generated by fermentation itself, what it'll do is just place 100% of all that liquid with CO2, so there's absolutely no air inside. Um, I, Jesus Christ, I gotta stop clucking. <laughs> um, uh, I don't normally do that because, like, I don't hook up my output to a keg, and it just sounds like it's using a lot of CO2, and I've had plenty of luck. Uh, and as always, uh, make sure you fill your kegs from the bottom up, minimize splashing. Uh, that's why I'm going in through the beverage out because that dip tube in the keg is going all the way down to the bottom. So there shouldn't be any splashing. Another uh, way to eliminate oxygen is a chemical method by using either potassium metabisulfite or sodium metabisulfite. Um, <clears throat> this is also known as like Camden. You, you know, you probably use Camden tablets to treat your water with maybe if it's full of chlorine. And uh, what sulfites do is actually on a chemical basis, convert your, um, convert oxygen in a way that it's like soluble and I'll get to that at the end. But uh, you wanna be a little bit careful using sulfites because in high doses, um, it'll, it could kill your yeast because it is used as a sterilizer. Um, and I think using sulfites is extra helpful when you're bottle conditioning since bottle conditioning can naturally have a greater um, risk of oxidation. So adding a pinch of uh, sulfite <clears throat> to your carbide before bottling or to the bottling bucket can help you greatly. Um, and you really only they need 0.3 grams for a five, ten, five gallon batch. Uh, this is a rate of 10 parts per million. Uh, so if you're looking at the chemical reaction here, we have the sodium metabisulfite. Or, that's not sodium. I don't know what that is. That's just sulfite. Yeah, I guess they're ignoring the sodium. But you got your sulfite, meta, your metasulfite. Um, when it mixes with water, it combines and splits into two uh, molecules of uh, hydrogen sulfite. Then, because your beer is acidic, there's all these free hydrogen atoms floating around. 
And your hydrogen sulfite is going to bond with your uh, uh, free hydrogen from your low pH environment in the presence of water uh, to create another form of sulfite and water. And this is a, a sulfur dioxide. And you might know of sulfur dioxide from, you may have heard it, it smells like rotten eggs. So if you convert too much of this into into sodium uh, dioxide, you could have like sort of like a farty smelling beer. Uh, I've never experienced this myself, but just be warned. And <clears throat> basically this just eliminates uh, your oxygen ingress from bonding to the lipids and to the acids of your beer. It'll get converted to sulfur dioxide instead, which is a stable compound and flavorless in very low amounts. Um, there's some pretty good pictures right here showing the stark contrast of beers that uh, on the left, let's say in this picture, was treated with sodium metabisulfite and on the right was not. Obvious difference in appearance. Same with, oh shit, same with on the right here. Uh, the one on the right was not treated and the one on the left was. Um, so there is very, there's objective evidence for uh, metabisulfites working against oxidation and you only need a little bit. I've never tried this though myself so uh, when I'm done and if, if anybody has experience with this uh, I'd like to know. In conclusion just really treat oxygen like your worst enemy um, in beer I mean. Um, take every precaution you can to limit it um, you might have to come up with new methods. You might have to change your, the way you brew um, unless you're experienced and don't have issues with this and you already do take precautions. But um, I think that like in this case, having nice equipment that has the technology capable of you doing like close transfers and stuff really helps. It's not necessary because I know a lot of brewers, um, their techniques with their equipment have been really successful in eliminating oxidation. But uh, I think this is one area, one aspect of homebrewing where uh, buying some equipment that helps you prevent oxygen is totally worth it, uh, makes it a lot easier. Um, and then I would strongly suggest kegging instead of bottle conditioning for most styles, just because there's a natural, um, they're just naturally less uh, oxidative than bottle conditioning, obviously. And then uh, I would consider using sulfites if you're storing your beer bottles for long or your bottle conditioning for a uh, competition perhaps. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, please, if you've tried sulfites, let me know because I'm super curious on your, uh, on your results. All right, that brings us to the end. Anybody have questions? No, it was a great presentation. Thanks, man. Yeah, the um, the tap that you were filling from. What's the brand of that and the brand of the counter pressure filler that you use? The counter pressure is called an inner cooler. Um, sorry, tap cooler. That's what I meant to say. Let me bring that up. This is one of my favorite gadgets. Um, if you have an inner tap faucet or a perlic faucet. So okay, so. On my inner tap, this this tip of the faucet actually screws off, and then this inner this tap cooler actually can screw on. Um, but it looks like there's an adapter for where you, you could just shove it into a faucet and it works. But um, okay, I wonder if they have a, an adapter for like a forward ceiling perlic. <clears throat> um, I think they do. I believe what's under here that's not shown is just like a post with an O-ring, like a double O-ring. That fits okay. into the and fits into the internal diameter. Um, these things are super rad. I, I love bottling with these things because you have your gas in. There's a ship. There's a separate trigger right here for your gas, and then uh, right here is an adjustable pressure release valve. So, yeah. And what's the name of that again? The uh, it's called the tap pressure. cooler. Tap cooler. Got it. Thank you. How much waste do you have on that? Uh process how much waste yeah i mean overflow uh not really a whole lot like if you 
So this pressure release valve is on is threaded. So right. the more you tighten it, the less gas is escaping. So um, once you pull your tap and it, your beer starts filling up, you can uh, unscrew this a little bit until your beer starts rising slowly. And then just the foam, just a little bit of foam will come out of the pressure release valve and then you cap it. So we're talking like like a tablespoon of foam per bottle or something like that. Okay. Uh, bottle temperature works the same? Any type of bottle temperature? No, freezer bottles. Okay. I have a question uh, about the Camden tablets. Yeah. Um, I don't really, really use that when I made wine. Um, now, what in what phase would you use Camden tablets? Like, when do I add that to the beer itself? Um, after fermentation is complete and before packaging. Uh, so, if you were kegging and you wanted to use some, add it to your keg, and then rack on top of it. Um, slowly just kind of work into the li liquid. Yeah, I mean, or you could dissolve it in water, sterile water, and add that. That'd probably be the best way. But yeah, um, I'm not sure what happens if you were to add it to the carboy or your fermenter. I don't know if there would be a negative impact there because I don't think you're adding enough to kill your yeast. Okay. And how many pe people online in our group, how many of you, or does anybody else use Camden tablets after fermentation? Ever. I think it's super worth experimenting with. There's, it's just proven to work online, not just from philosophy or anything, but um, uh, I've heard success stories of people who don't have a kegging setup, but they really like drinking hazy IPAs. So they'll add some sulfites to the bottles um, and it'll carb up, it'll still carb up, but they won't have oxidized hazy IPAs. It's just magic like that. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm laying around, so I might as well use it. You talked about your closed transfer. Yeah. And uh, you, you talked about putting your beer in through the outlet to, to reduce the splashing, right? Yeah. It, why would you have to do that if it's a purged keg? Um, if it's a completely purged keg, you wouldn't, I don't think it would matter a whole lot. Um, but with me, I don't get 100% of the atmospheric air out of my kegs. Uh, like, uh, I'll, I'll fill them up to like 30 PSI and then like pull the PRV. Oh, okay. Um, right. But, but if, if, if it was 100% CO2 in the keg, I think you could splash. I, I just wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. <clears throat> Well, the, the reason I ask is I've, I've heard it, people say that even when, you know, I fill the star sand and then pump it out. So it's all CO2 in there. Uh, and I've got either screens around my pickup or a floating pickup, in which case, well, then why would I push beer through that and clog mm -hmm. the inside of my screen? Yeah, don't do that. Um, yeah. what, what I would do in that case is open the lid to your keg and use a tube that goes all the way down to the bottom. Well, I, but that then it's no longer closed. So I just mm -mm. push it in through the uh, inlet and let it splash. Oh, the gas in? Yeah. Because there's nothing but CO2 in there. Yeah. In I theory, think. that should work. I don't think the beer you make is oxidized either. So I think it's working. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be a problem, Dave. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I closed system. 